Father, thank you for your word. <clears throat> I thank you for the verses we've reached in Luke's gospel. I pray that we can understand them well, because I think there's almost an apologetic nature to them in, in answering some of the questions people have about the Old Testament and how people came to faith in Christ in the Old Testament when his, um, he was veiled and shadowy to us, Lord, but we needed to be saved by grace through faith. As there's never been any other way for man to be reconciled to himself, and so understanding that it's our faith in Christ that saves us, then how were people saved in the Old Testament, and how did they look forward to Christ, and considering the limited revelation they have. And so I pray that could be answered, Lord. I pray you'd be exalted through this morning's preaching and that we'd see that you've always been a saving God, that you've always been reconciling men to yourself since the fall took place. I know there's a little more technical information in this, and so I just pray for a wonderful understanding in our hearts, Lord, that you would stretch our, our minds to take in uh, the, the truths we're going to be receiving this morning and help us to be attentive and remove any distractions so we can completely focus on you and what you want to say to us. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> amen, amen. So the title of this morning's sermon is The Mystery of Christ. Sunday mornings have been in Luke's Gospel, verse by verse, and we will turn there, but go ahead and stay in Colossians because we need to look at a little bit here first. I'm going to give quite a bit of background information before we turn to Luke. And so first, let me explain what a mystery is, biblically speaking. Not a mystery the way that you, you might define it, but the way the Bible defines a mystery is it's something that's concealed and then revealed. And by the way, if you hear a baby, uh, every chance I get, I want to relay that we love the sounds of babies here, and so we like to leave the foyer free for, for uh, nursing mothers or perhaps even fathers that want to carry babies around, and so we're always thankful for the sound of babies never need to be uncomfortable. Uh, there's no awkwardness associated with it. I can always speak louder. They can turn me up at the sound booth. So <clears throat> a mystery is something that is concealed until God chooses to reveal it. And what that means is given any amount of time and effort, we could never determine what a mystery is, biblically speaking, because that's a little different than a mystery in our vernacular. Like if a, there's a really difficult math problem that was put up on the wall behind me, you could say, well, that's a mystery to me, but given enough time and effort and education, you could figure out what that is. But in Scripture, something remains a mystery or remains hidden until God chooses to reveal it to people. If you look in Colossians 2, Paul is talking about a mystery. And in verse 1, I want you to see just how much he wants his readers, including all of us, to understand or know this mystery. In verse 1, he says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, so basically everyone, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of this mystery, which he says is God's mystery, which is Christ. And so verse 2 clearly says that Christ is God's mystery, and this brings us to lesson 1. Christ was a mystery. <coughs> Christ was a mystery. So here's the question, why was Christ a mystery? I just defined a mystery for you, so this shouldn't be a mystery, no pun intended. Why is Christ a mystery? Because he was, he was hidden or concealed and then revealed later. Christ was hidden or concealed until God chose to reveal him. He could not be known until God chose to reveal him. Look a few verses earlier at Colossians 1 verse 26. Colossians 1 verse 26, Paul said, the mystery, a mystery that was hidden or concealed for ages and generations, which refers to throughout the entire Old Testament, but has now been revealed to his saints, now being the church age, or the time of Paul's writing, but also throughout all church history into our day. So Christ was a mystery that was hidden in the past, hidden throughout the Old Testament, but God has revealed him to New Testament saints. And then verse 27, to them... God chose to make known or to reveal what had been concealed. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So those words, God chose to make known, mean God revealed the mystery of Christ. 
Now consider this for a moment. I've been talking about Christ being a mystery or hidden throughout the Old Testament. But many of you probably would answer this correctly. What is the Old Testament primarily about? Christ. Do you see some tension there? Christ has been hidden or concealed throughout the Old Testament, yet you, because you know your Bibles, know that the Old Testament is primarily about Christ. Luke 24, 27, beginning at Moses and the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures, referring to the Old Testament because that's all there was, the things concerning himself. <clears throat> all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, a way to refer to the Old Testament, concerning me. So Jesus says the law, the prophets, the Psalms, it's all concerning me. When Philip understood the mystery of Christ, do you remember he was excited? This mystery was resolved or solved for him. And then what did he want to do? He wanted to quickly tell someone, right? So Philip <clears throat> goes to his friend Nathaniel. John 1, 45, 46, Philip finds Nathaniel and says to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and all, also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. So Philip says, Moses and all the prophets are the Old Testament. It was written about Christ. We found the man whom the Old Testament was about. Hebrews 10, 7, Jesus said, Behold, I've come, the volume of the book, it is written of me. And so it begs the question, is Christ concealed or revealed in the Old Testament? On one hand, we have the New Testament saying Christ was a mystery in the Old Testament. And on the other hand, we have the New Testament saying the Old Testament is about Christ. So which is it? Is Christ concealed or revealed in the Old Testament? Yes. <laughs> it's both. It's both. Christ was hidden in the Old Testament, but here's the thing. If he was completely hidden, people couldn't be what? If Christ was, we are saved, we are justified or declared righteous by our faith in Christ. So unless we're the only people who are saved or unless nobody in the Old Testament is saved, what did those people, Old Testament saints, have to be putting their faith in to be saved? They had to put their faith in Christ or they couldn't be saved. There's no salvation apart from, apart from faith in Christ. So if Christ was completely hidden with no way to look forward to him in faith, nobody could be saved until that mystery was completely resolved. So God provided two ways for people to look forward to Christ in faith. In the darkness of the Old Testament, there were primarily two ways for people to look forward to Christ in faith to be saved. And this brings us to lesson two. The Old Testament saints, part one, looked forward to Christ in faith through prophecies and shadows. <clears throat> the Old Testament saints, part one, looked forward to Christ in faith through prophecies and shadows. You know this, the Old Testament filled with prophecies of Christ, around 350 of them he fulfilled just in his first coming. And as people believed these prophecies about the coming Messiah or believed these prophecies that there would be a coming Messiah who would fulfill these prophecies, these people were what? They were justified or they were declared righteous by their faith in these prophecies or the reality that God was going to send a Messiah. Who is the premier Old Testament saint that Paul plucks up out of the Old Testament and sets down as the example for us throughout Romans and Galatians of being justified by faith? Abraham. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and God credited his faith to him as righteousness. You have Abraham being justified by faith as he believed the promises or promises that God made to him about a Messiah who would come and bless all the nations of the earth. I think it's Galatians 3, 8. It says, it, you don't have to turn there, but it says, God preached the gospel to Abraham. And you're like, God told Abraham about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? No, but he did allow God, he did allow Abraham to look forward to, he, God did allow Abraham to look forward to Christ in faith when he said that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, referring to his seed, Christ, and as Abraham believed that that seed would come into the world or that God's words to him would be fulfilled, he was 
justified by faith. He looked forward in faith to Christ coming like we look back in faith to Christ having come. <clears throat> Second, Old Testament saints could look forward to Christ through shadows and types. You're in Colossians. Look at Colossians 2, verse 16. Colossians 2, verse 16. <clears throat> Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So here's the context. Paul doesn't want any New Testament or church age believers feeling condemned regarding not observing certain commands from the Mosaic law or old covenant that are no longer binding. So Paul knew that there were certain commands that were part of the ceremonial law in particular or the Mosaic law or old covenant that were no longer binding for Christians today. And he did not want Christians feeling condemned for not observing those commands that are no longer binding. And so he says, hey, don't let anyone pass judgment on you. Don't let anyone condemn you for the things you're doing or for these commands you're not observing because they're no longer binding today. Now, elements of the Mosaic law contained shadows of Christ. And look at him mention that in the next verse. He says, these things are a shadow. That's where we get types and shadows from, a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So these elements of the Mosaic law contained shadows of Christ, but Christ himself is the substance. You don't have to turn there, but one other verse making this point. Hebrews 10, 1, the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of those realities. So in Colossians 2, 17, we've got Christ being called the substance of the law. In Hebrews 10, 1, we've got Christ being called the reality of the law. These things were just shadows that looked forward to him. And shadows, it's a fitting way to describe Christ or these types of Christ. Let me say that again. Shadows are a fitting way to describe the types of Christ because shadows are pointing to something else, right? Whenever you see a shadow, you know there's something casting it, or in this case, someone casting it, right? You never look at the shadow of a tree and say, hey, look at that wonderful tree, unless you're looking at the actual tree, right? You never look at the shadow of a car and say, hey, look at that car. You understand there's a tree or a car that's casting that shadow. Shadows have no substance of themselves. They're not the reality. Instead, they're evidence that there's something behind them, or in this case, someone. Shadows is also fitting because shadows give you an idea what something looks like, right? They give you some detail, some, some shape without completely revealing the object. The New Testament identifies many of the shadows and types of Christ. Just a few of them, although there's, there's lots more I could give you. John 3, 14 compares Jesus with the bronze serpent. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that bronze serpent, when they looked to it, they were seeing a type or shadow of Christ in that and that they could look up to that bronze serpent when it was, when it, and it saved them by faith in it. The same way that we look to Christ hanging on that cross. Bronze, a picture of judgment. A serpent, a picture of sin. You say, well, that's, I'm, an, I'm not real comfortable with Christ being compared with a bronze serpent. We should be because, it's, because when Christ was lifted up, he became sin for us, right? You look to him to be saved. Bronze, a picture of judgment. Your sin was judged on that, on that cross. John 6, the manna. All that manna that fell down in the wilderness was just a picture or type of the true and greater manna or bread from heaven that is Christ. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In other, in other words, the true bread is not bread that would keep you alive for a few days or weeks. The true bread is me that gives eternal life, not temporary life. 1 Corinthians 10.4, Israel drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. <clears throat> all these types and shadows, you probably know if you've sat under my preaching for very long, I love, I love types and shadows. I came to love Christ through them as I saw him revealed throughout the Old Testament. Certain practices served as shadows of Christ. <clears throat> the most obvious one, every single sacrifice was what? A shadow looking forward to the true and greater sacrifice of Christ that would bring all those types and shadows to an end with the substance of reality being found in Jesus. Hebrews 4 tells us that the Sabbath rest, or the rest that people enjoyed on one day of the week, was only a type or shadow of the true and greater rest 
not a rest one day of the week, but a rest we can enjoy all seven days of the week as we no longer have to strive or work to be saved. There were certain practices that looked forward to, besides just the Sabbath, that also looked forward to Christ. Look in Colossians 2 verse 11. Try to get as much out of this this book while we're in it. Look in Colossians 2 verse 11. It says, in him also you were circumcised. So in Christ you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. When it says made without hands, it means it's not a physical circumcision that Christ gives us, but it's one of putting off the body of flesh, not physical flesh, but the sinful flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So physical circumcision always served as a type or shadow of the putting off, not of physical flesh, but of the spiritual flesh, which is ultimately found in Christ. Now, you're saying, well, what, what, connect, what does this all have to do with what we're talking about? When people engaged in these practices, they engaged in them in faith. They prefigured or foreshadowed the true and greater realities in Christ. And as they did these things, and as they saw Christ through them in faith, they were justified or saved by that faith. It's not the practices themselves that saved them. None of those sacrifices could have saved people or Christ would not have had to come. But as people engaged in those sacrifices in faith, prefiguring or foreshadowing Christ, they were then justified or declared righteous by their faith. Another reason that the word shadows is so fitting is it describes how Old Testament saints saw Christ. They saw him in a very shadowy or veiled way. And this brings us to lesson three, or excuse me, lesson two. Old Testament saints, part two, strained to understand the mystery of Christ. Old Testament saints, part two, strained to understand the mystery of Christ. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 1. I think this sermon probably has the record for the most words I've ever removed from a message. I think there was almost 4,000 words I removed from this message. I could have done two sermons, but I wanted to keep it to one sermon. But as you can tell, there was a lot more that (laughs) that we could have talked about. So here's the situation. Old Testament saints, they're straining to understand the mystery of Christ. And to give you an analogy, imagine we turn off all the lights in this room and imagine, or you're in any, any dark room and you're straining to see something on the other side of the room. You can make out some of the details, but you can't see it very clearly. You, it's like you understand something's there and some people with better sight might be able to make out a little more or see a little more or see a little further or better than someone else, but nobody can see it very well because it's so dark. The light of the gospel hasn't been turned on to eliminate Christ yet. So all these Old Testament saints are straining through the darkness of the Old Testament to see what's on the other side of that room. And in 1 Peter 1, it's a really unique section of Scripture because it gives us this insight into the lives of these Old Testament prophets who had the greatest sight. I mean, what's the other term for prophets? They're also called what? Seers seers because they see and even those who could see the best in the darkness of the old testament before the light of the gospel illuminated things still had to strain or struggle to see christ or make out this mystery look in verse 10 concerning this salvation that means the salvation that's been made available to us in the new testament or the revelation that's been made available to us in the new testament the prophets who prophesied, so these are the very prophets who are prophesying about the grace that was going to be ours, they searched and they inquired carefully. That is describing these Old Testament prophets in the darkness, straining or struggling to see Christ. Verse 11 says they were inquiring what person or time, the type of Christ or the Spirit of Christ, which is just another name for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was in them because they're writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So they're writing things they don't even fully understand. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being inspired or moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit to write things that you don't even fully understand, that you're trying to make out or understand as you pen it? Verse 12, 
And that's what was happening there, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ, another name for the Holy Spirit, in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So they're getting this limited revelation through the prophecies and types and shadows that are being given to them. They're writing these things down. They know the Messiah is there or coming, but they can't make him out. They're straining through the darkness. They, they know, know something great's coming, but they don't know exactly when. They don't know exactly who. So they're asking, who is the Christ? When will he come? What will the Christ be like? Those are the questions that the prophets were asking. I mean, have you ever considered for a moment the grace that's been given to you through the revelation we have and what others would have, would have given to know what we know? One of the reasons that things were so confusing for Old Testament saints, it's contained in the phrase or the words, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Did you see that in the verse? The sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Well, those seem incompatible. Those seem mutually exclusive. Do you see why there was difficulty making out the Messiah when there were prophecies about his suffering and about his what? Glory. So there was this very, do you, I, I think it's really important for us to understand this. There was almost a paradoxical nature to the Messiah for Old Testament saints. It's like, okay, I see this mountain of verses about, and I see Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 about this suffering Messiah who's going to come and be rejected. And I also see this mountain of verses about a glorified Messiah. I've got Psalm 2, Isaiah 45, he's going to be worshiped and exalted. And so it's like this. Old Testament saints are like, is the Messiah going to be glorified or suffering? Is he going to be accepted or rejected? And what is it? Yes, again, isn't it? <laughs> it's both again, isn't it? He is the Messiah of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, and he's the Messiah of Psalm 2 and Isaiah 45. He's the Messiah who is exalted, and he's the Messiah who's rejected. And why is that, or how's that? Because of two comings. That is the only way to harmonize, harmonize these prophecies. You've got the suffering and the rejection in the first coming, the exaltation and worship in the second coming. Without two comings, I don't know how you harmonize or reconcile these seemingly mutually exclusive prophecies who are saying, which are saying opposite things about Christ. Either he's accepted or he's rejected. Either he's worshipped or he suffers, but it's not both unless you have two comings. Then look at verse 12. <clears throat> oh, and this is the other thing. Guess what else was a mystery, though, in the Old Testament? Two comings. So that's why it was difficult. Does the Old Testament... Can you tell me where the Old Testament says there were two comings? I mean, it's why Jews reject Christ. They don't see two comings. And so they apply all the suffering passages to themselves. Isaiah, they are the suffering servant of Isaiah. They've been serving the Lord faithfully for millennium, suffering. So the Jews are like, we are Isaiah 53. That is about us. This is about us in Psalm 22. It is not about this guy you call Jesus. So the two comings were another mystery that made these things difficult. Now, in verse 12, notice this. It was revealed to them, so the Old Testament prophets, that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from them. That's a long, long verse there. And sometimes Paul gets criticized for his long sentences, but that's a long sentence right there. Here's the point. The prophets knew that they weren't serving or writing primarily for who? Huh? Themselves. They actually knew that they're writing for you, for me, when the lights fully turned on. They knew they weren't serving themselves. They knew this wasn't going to make total sense. Do you remember the end of Daniel? The first half of Daniel, the narrative of his life. The second half of Daniel contains all those visions. And then what does the angel tell Daniel? Put this away. This is not for you. It does not belong to you. I think it's in Daniel 12. I can't remember the exact verse. But Daniel was told by this angel, put this away. It is not for you. It is for the people in the future. And that's a good example of what the prophets were dealing with. And even when it says the prophets were searching and inquiring, when the prophets were searching and inquiring, what were they searching and inquiring? The prophets' writings. They were looking at each other's writings. Whose writings did Daniel read 
to determine the exile was going to be 70 years. Daniel read Jeremiah like you read Jeremiah. He searched and inquired like we search and inquire. And then look at the rest of verse 12. Things into which angels long to look. So angels, they don't have foresight or foreknowledge, or at least not that I'm aware of, or at least they don't have it like God does. And so the point is that for angels, revelation is also what? It is progressive in that further revelation is given over time, and it's cumulative, and then it builds on previous revelation. Not just for us, but for angels themselves. So you've got angels from heaven looking down with fascination on the revelation that's being given to us, looking in to understand the plan of redemption, because who's not redeemed? Who, do, who does not experience redemption? Because they move, they would have to move, they're in a, they're in a state that they don't have to be redeemed from. And that's why there's no redemption from Lucifer, because he moved from that perfect, perfected state to a fallen state. We move from a fallen state to a perfected state. We move in the opposite direction as them. There's no redemption for angels. So they're looking in to understand something taking place with us, redemption and salvation, that is very unfamiliar to them or foreign to them. So some people say, well, can angels be saved? They can't be saved. They left perfection and when they followed Lucifer and his rebellion. It says they're longing or desiring to look in and understand the mystery of Christ that has been made available to us. Think of Jesus' words, Matthew 13, 16. Listen to this, and I hope you will feel as blessed when I read this to you as I feel considering the truth of these verses. Jesus said, blessed are your eyes for they see, and he's not talking physically, and your ears for they hear, and he doesn't mean physically, he means spiritually. He was referring to us understanding the mystery of Christ. He says, blessed are your ears for they see, and your, ear, your eyes for they see, your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, there are many prophets and righteous people who longed to see what you see and did not see it, to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Do you have any idea how many of those Old Testament saints, while they were searching and inquiring in the darkness of the Old Testament, would have given anything to understand what you understand? see what you see, hear what you hear. I mean, it's incredible, the revelation that's been given to us, the grace that has been poured out on us. Now, hopefully, you can see the larger purpose of the Old Testament. It leads people to Christ. And if you can understand this purpose of the Old Testament, it takes on an entirely fresh and new perspective for you. There are too many people who view the Old Testament wrongly. It is nothing more than a rule book. And that's it of telling you what to do, of do's and don'ts. And that is such a far cry from the beauty and greatness of the Old Testament. And this brings us to lesson four. Think of the Old Testament as a key versus only a rule book. Lesson, or yeah, lesson four, lesson three, sorry, lesson three. Think of the Old Testament as a key versus only a rule book. I've even heard some mature Christians, well, you know, I don't read the Old Testament. It's just a bunch of do's and don'ts, and I don't like it. It's not about Christ. And I'm just like, ah! <laughs> don't, even if you think that, don't say that to me if we're going to remain friends. I just can't, I cannot hear that. You've been a Christian long enough. You should not be saying that. So <clears throat> the Old Testament, yeah, it contains the law, and there's a lot, there's 613 commands, but <laughs> it's so much more than that. It is the key to unlock the mystery of Christ is filled with all the prophecies and the types and shadows of him. Turn to Galatians 3.23. <coughs> Galatians 3.23. Okay, Galatians 3.23, it says, Before faith came... We were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Now, when it says before faith came, it doesn't mean like before faith existed or that there was some time when there was no faith or no potential for faith. It means before we came to faith or before people came to faith or before you came to faith. Before you came to faith, you were held captive by, or in a sense, you were even a slave to what? 
the law. Sin is true also. Why were you a slave or captive to the law before you came to faith in Christ? Because you had to obey it or keep it perfectly to be saved, right? What are the two ways to be saved? You put faith in Christ or you keep the law perfectly. When you come to faith in Christ, you're no longer a slave to the law and that you no longer need to keep it perfectly to be saved. But until that moment, you're held captive by the law. You're striving to keep it for salvation, whether you know it or not. There's a lot of people that don't even know that when they stand before the Lord someday, they're going to be judged because they've rejected Him by how perfectly or how imperfectly they have kept the law. Now, at the end of the verse, notice the word revealed. That's a perfect word for what we're talking about. It says, until the coming faith would be revealed. We come to faith when the mystery of Christ is revealed to us, or Christ is no longer concealed from us. Before that, we're held captive by the law to be saved. And then verse 24, so then the law, it was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So we were kept by the law until we're justified or declared righteous by faith because we're trying to be justified by the law, which none of us can do until that moment. Verse 25, but now the faith has come, which doesn't mean there's a moment faith came. It means when we came to faith in Christ or when we started having faith in Christ, at that moment, we're no longer under a guardian or we're no longer under the law, which perfectly describes the purpose of the law to bring us to Christ so that we would be justified or declared righteous. That's the purpose of the Old Testament. And so here's what's interesting. Once the Old Testament has brought you to Christ, it has served its largest and greatest purpose. And so if you knew the whole Old Testament, you could recount every story, you could quote countless verses, but you didn't know Christ or see Him through it, then you have failed to let the Old Testament serve its primary purpose in your life. There's a sense in which you would be in the language of Hebrews 10.1 or Colossians 2.17, looking at the shadow of the tree or the shadow of the car and saying what? Oh, look at that great tree or oh, look at that great car. You're missing the substance or the reality. You're seeing the shadows without seeing the true and greater truth behind them. Were there people in Jesus' day who knew the Old Testament super well but failed to see Christ through it and were rebuked by him? The religious leaders, listen to this. Jesus said, John 5, 39, you searched the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. In other words, Jesus said, you think you're going to read the Old Testament scriptures and be saved by them. You don't understand. It is they that bear witness or testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And so Jesus tells them, you know the Old Testament inside and out, but you don't see me through it, and so you don't have life, no matter how much you know of the Scriptures. Okay, now we're finally ready to read Luke 16, if you want to go and turn there. That was the background. And I don't think we turn anyplace else. Luke 16. Luke 16, verse 16, this is our, we finished verse 15 last week, so Luke 16, 16 is our new verse for this morning. <clears throat> the law and the prophets were until John, since then the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Just one more time. The law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist, and since then the good news or the gospel of the kingdom is preached and everyone forces his way into it. This is one of the clearest verses about a basic division in God's plan. Because the law and the prophets refers to what? What is the law and the prophets? It's just a New Testament way to refer to what? The Old Testament, right? And it says that the Old Testament lasted, or not lasted, the Old Testament was preached until John. Consider that when the Old Testament ended with Malachi... How much silence was there? 400 years of silence. When Malachi stopped, you have four centuries of silence until the next Old Testament prophet in the New Testament, he is an Old Testament prophet even though he's in the New Testament, speaks, and who's that? That's John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist is this transitional figure between the Old and New Testaments because he's the last Old Testament prophet, even though he's in the New Testament. And this brings us to lesson four or lesson five, John's ministry solved the mystery of Christ. Lesson four, John's ministry solved the mystery of Christ. John MacArthur wrote, John the Baptist's ministry marked the turning point of redemptive history. Prior to that, the great truths of Christ and his kingdom were veiled in the types and shadows of the law and promised in the writings of the prophets. So when John came, the veil is removed. When John preaches, there's nothing shadowy. Listen to this and consider whether there's any veil or shadow to John's statement. John 1.15, John bore witness about Christ and cried out and said, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So John says, this is the one I've been telling you about. Look at him. There's no veil. There's no shadow. There's no darkness any longer. The light of the gospel is turned on. You see what the prophets have been straining to see throughout the Old Testament. John 1, 29, John saw Jesus and said, behold what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No veil, no shadowy language whatsoever. This is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah I've been telling you about. I'm not worthy to untie his, his, sand, his shoelace, or I don't have shoelace, you know what I'm saying though, his sandals, take them off, anything like that. This is him. I am his forerunner. So it's perfectly clear now. And so what you can do is you can think of the Old Testament like one big promise, and then when God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ and brought the kingdom of God from heaven to earth, the time of promise or prophecy was over, and the time of reality and substance has begun. So in the Old Testament, people are looking forward to the coming kingdom, but in John's day, that kingdom has arrived. Imagine that. They're looking forward to the Messiah coming, but in John's day, the Messiah has come. Consider this statement Jesus said about John. True, Matthew eleven eleven. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And people, they handle this wrongly. People have arguments. Who's the greatest, who's the greatest man? Is it Daniel? Is it Sam? Oh, no, it's John. John nobody, nobody greater than John has, has ever been born greater than John the Baptist, because that's what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus meant. Because Jesus goes on to say that who's even greater than John? You and me. Just listen to the whole verse. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So it was not talking about John being greater morally or righteously. It wasn't to say that John was better than Daniel or Samuel or Noah or anything like that. Instead, he was talking experientially that John was great, but believers after John are greater because they can enter the kingdom of God that was brought from heaven to earth. So as great as it was to be John because he was the forerunner of the Messiah and he could see Christ, which made him greater than all the other Old Testament saints, it is still greater to be the least in the kingdom of God because you're still in the kingdom of God. And as you read the Gospels, you notice that they didn't preach the Gospel like we do. They didn't preach Christ's death, burial, and resurrection because Christ hadn't died, but buried, and resurrected yet. Instead, they preached the kingdom of God. And in verse 16, that's what it says. In verse 16, notice the words, since then, or since John, the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached. So in the Old Testament, they're looking forward in faith to the kingdom coming, but you read the Gospels, the kingdom has come, and now they're preaching that kingdom because it's been brought from heaven to earth and people need to enter it. And so that's what you see throughout the Gospels, the kingdom being preached. The 12 go out, the 70 go out, John was out, Jesus is preaching, and they're all preaching the same thing, they're all preaching the kingdom of God. In the New Testament, we preach Jesus' death, burial, and, or in the church age, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then it says, everyone forces his way into it. Now, what exactly does this mean? 
that people force their way into the kingdom of God, it almost sounds like you got to try super hard, right? You better try hard enough or you might not make it. If you don't put forth enough effort, you will not be able to get into the kingdom of God. It's similar to Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So that verse makes it sound like there's a bunch of people who are trying really hard to get to the narrow door, but there are some people that are not trying hard enough, and they don't make it through the narrow door. They don't get to enter. So either way, it sounds like it's all about human effort or achievement. Almost sounds like the off the opposite of the gospel, right? That's not really what Jesus is saying. Instead, when the kingdom of God came, people faced a choice. And in the language of Luke 16, 16, they could force their way into it. In the language of Luke 13, 24, they could strive to enter. And this brings us to lesson six, part one. The kingdom of God brought a choice in Jesus's day. The kingdom of God brought a choice in Jesus's day or lesson five, excuse me, sorry, my lesson's wrong in my notes. <clears throat> Here's the best way to understand this. When the kingdom of God arrived, or when it came from heaven to earth, there was urgency. There was to be desire to enter it. And there were those in Christ's day, or in John's day, who urgently desire to enter the kingdom, and Jesus talks about them as people who were forcing their way into it because they had such a strong, urgent desire or zeal to be part of it. And then there's also people who what? Just didn't care. They disregarded the kingdom. They rejected Christ, and they rejected the kingdom He brought. And it's important to understand that Jesus said this to who? In case you don't remember the context, because it was in the previous sermon. He's talking to the religious leaders. And so Jesus is presenting a contrast. He's actually rebuking the religious leaders by talking about how urgently and zealously some people are pressing into the kingdom to contrast those people with what the religious leaders were doing. And so Jesus uses the zeal of people trying to enter the kingdom to rebuke the religious leaders who did not care about entering at all. He points out that some people wanted so badly to be part of the kingdom, but then you've got the religious leaders who have Christ in front of him, in front of them, the kingdom that he brought being offered, and they rejected both. Now look back in Luke 16, 16 at the phrase, the law and the prophets were until John. The law and the prophets were until John. So what could that cause people to wonder that statement from christ that the law and the prophets are until john people could say well is the law done away with then does this mean that the law is irrelevant or it's meaningless and to prevent people from thinking that jesus preaches verse 17 he says it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void Because do you see the context? Do you see the flow? He's saying the law is only until John. And then people are like, oh, so there's no more Old Testament or the law doesn't mean anything. And then Jesus says in verse 17, to clear up that possible perception, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Now, unfortunately, this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the Gospels. And here's why. It is commonly quoted by people who want to convince you that you must obey all of the Old Testament commands. And they will say something like this. You've got to keep the Old Testament law because Jesus said it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot to become void. And I'm just saying, if you look at the Old Testament law and there's commands that you want to keep for whatever reason, I'm not talking about the moral commands, which are still binding in the New Testament, but you don't want to you know, eat bacon, or you want to handle your gardening a certain way, or you, you know, you buy some clothes, you don't want the fabrics mixed together, because that's what God's law says. You can obey those commands. You can't obey them for salvation, or you shouldn't, and you can't tell others to obey them. But the problem is there are some people that come and they say, no, you've got to obey them. You can't eat this. You've got to do this. You can't do this. It's like in Colossians 2, where Paul says, no, let no one judge you regarding these things, These people want to judge you regarding these things, and they're going to quote this verse. They're going to say, no, heaven and earth won't pass away, so you better be keeping these commands. 
But there's two possible ways to interpret the law not becoming void. One possibility is that the law is not voided and it is in effect today, in which case we should all keep those commands. The other possibility is the law is not unfulfilled. When Jesus says the law does not become void, he means it does not go unfulfilled. It's like Jesus said, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to be unfulfilled. And that second interpretation is the one that harmonizes with the rest of Scripture. So what are we going to do whenever we have two possible interpretations? We let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we always hold to the interpretation that does what? Harmonizes with the rest of Scripture, right? Well, listen to this. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do what? But to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law until it is fulfilled. So notice what Jesus did and didn't say. He did say that he came to fulfill the law. He did not say that he came to enforce the law. And when you read the epistles, there are lots of commands that are not enforced. So Jesus is not talking to the religious leaders about the law applying today. He's talking to them about fulfilling the law when he came. That's the context. Even the context of this passage makes it clear what he's saying. The context is, I am the Messiah. I came to fulfill the law. He's not here telling them to obey certain commands. And there are many places in the New Testament letting us know that we no longer have to keep certain commands. Acts 10 and 11, we see the food commands are no longer binding. Acts 15, we see the circumcision is no longer required. We know the sacrifices are no longer required. There's no more earthly priesthood with Christ serving as our great high priest. No more physical temple with believers becoming the temple of God. And so because Jesus fulfilled the law so perfectly, we actually must make a choice in our day, just like the people had to make a choice in Jesus' day. And this brings us to part two. The kingdom of God brought a choice in Jesus' day, part two, and ours. The kingdom of God brought a choice in Jesus' day, and it brings a choice in our day. So with Christ's first coming, it's an, it's an incredible time. I mean, all the prophecies associated with his first coming are fulfilled. All of the types and shadows associated with his first coming are fulfilled. The mystery of Christ is solved. Jesus is the Messiah. Now the prophets no longer need to ask, when is he coming? What is he going to be like? The substance and the reality can be seen in Christ. We're no longer in the dark. The Old Testament truths are revealed in the, you know, the bright light of the gospel has filled that room. And so we face a choice, just like the people in Jesus' day. Entrance into the kingdom, and this is what's interesting, it was not automatic for the Jews. Entrance into the kingdom was not automatic for God's covenant people. They had to exercise saving faith in Christ to be brought into the kingdom. Well, what's my point? If entrance into God's kingdom was not even automatic for the covenant people, the Jews, in fact, many of the Jews in Jesus' day were excluded because they didn't exercise faith in Christ, it sure is not going to be automatic for us, a bunch of Gentiles. And so we face a choice. There is an urgent call in our day, just like in Jesus' day, to decide for or against Christ. Will we be like those in Christ's day who force our way into the kingdom by exercising faith in Christ, or will we be like the religious leaders and disregard it? But it's a question all of us must answer. Now, if you have any questions about anything I've shared this morning, I will be up front after service, and I'd consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for the revelation that's been given that he's no longer a mystery to us, that the gospel has shown the bright light that shows the substance and reality that's found in him. I thank you that this is solved for us, Lord, and would pray for anyone who has not uh, decided for Christ, that you would make that clear to them and you would convict them, that today would be the day of salvation for them.
I pray we could have a right view of, of the Old Testament. I think we can get so much more out of reading it when we look for Christ behind the types and shadows. I thank you for the, the revelation we're given of him and help us to find joy and satisfaction in reading the Old Testament that we haven't found before and, and illuminate your son to us through those wonderful 39 books, Lord. I thank you for this time this morning, for what Christ has done for us. We pray these things in his name. Amen.